When you get a middle-aged woman or, or elderly woman that comes in and uses the leg press and then stands up and has to hold on because she's dizzy, you realize that that's because of salt depletion. I want to transition real quickly because I talk a lot about sodium in the mm-hmm. vertical diet. And yeah, and he just had like four packets of element, like <laughs> four, yeah, yeah. four okay. grams of salt. <laughs> and, and that becomes an important component of a whole food diet, uh, a, a, a low-carb diet. Uh, one of the things that people do experience is the the keto flu or what have you, and it, it's just the fact that when you when you uh, lose glycogen from the muscle, you're also losing three parts water, which is about what seventy plus percent, uh, probably more sodium. Uh, so people can get uh, some some uh, deficiency in salt in particular, um, uh, other minerals as well. But and so we add salt back in. That's an important part of uh, compensating for the loss of that. Again, 70% of the population is eating, you know, highly processed, ultra processed food. That stuff's very rich in salt. So when I made my recommendations, when I talked about sodium uh, some years ago, um, the medical community was all up in arms, uh, obviously conflating my recommendation with those for hypertensive, sedentary, uh, overweight people, uh, which I specifically said, this is a recommendation for active people who aren't eating fast food uh, or, you know, highly processed foods. And uh, if you're hypertensive, which somewhere around 20 to 30% of the population is salt sensitive or hypertensive, uh, a lot of that is probably due to their current health condition, uh, you should not add salt to your diet. You should probably stay on a lower sodium diet. There's more important things you can do to reduce hypertension, such as resolving sleep apnea, losing weight, uh, getting sufficient micronutrients, such as mm-hmm. potassium and magnesium, et cetera. Uh, and that bears out in the studies. But you do want to add salt back in to the diet. And there's, uh, there's a number of studies that suggest that uh, kind of the average worldwide is somewhere between three and six grams or 3.5 and five grams. Kind of if you look at, at all the populations throughout the world, it's kind of that's where they settle in at. Um, uh, and so I think it's important that you use that kind of as a baseline because there's there, what the studies continue to say, and I, I've printed out a whole bunch of them here, uh, that the current evidence suggests that, that if you're not hypertensive, that, uh, that eating that sodium does not have an adverse effect on cardiovascular disease. One of the largest studies, of course, was the PEER study, which I referenced years ago, but they did uh, another recent update. And Salem Yusuf said, uh, he's the, um, he's the uh, president of the World Heart Federation. He's a cardiologist out of Canada and one of the uh, uh, lead researchers on the, the PEER study, which is one of the largest Current evidence indicates that uh, most people around the world consume a moderate range of dietary sodium, three to five grams a day, and that this level of intake is associated with the lowest risk of cardiovascular disease and mortality. Several uh, health organizations, and this is important here, several health organizations recommend low sodium intake for the entire population, a level that has not been achieved by any modern population in the world. We talk about compliance. We talk about recommending things to people that they can do consistently. These short-term studies like the DASH diet and some others uh, are usually 30-day studies. And they're also confounded by the fact that there's studies on hypertensives and they also dramatically increase potassium and magnesium in the diet to eat more fruits and vegetables. So Mm -hmm. what's the effect for the weight loss? Pat Project family, is TRT or HRT something that you've been interested in? Well, if you are, that's why we've partnered with Merrick Health, owned by Derek for More Plates, More Dates. They are the premium telehealth TRT and HRT clinic. And the great thing about Merrick Health that is so unique about them is that versus every other telehealth clinic out there, they give you direct plans for you specifically. Many clinics give you just plans that they give to everybody else. But we are individuals. We have different hormonal levels. We need unique plans. That's why you need to check out Merrick Health. And Andrew, can you tell the people how to do it? Yes, over at MerrickHealth.com, M-A-R-E-K health.com. Um, when it comes time to actually purchasing these labs and paying for them, if you're talking to somebody on the phone, you can just mention promo code Power Project 15. Or if you are manually checking out on your own, you can enter promo code Power Project 15 to save 15% off all labs. Links to them down in the description, as well as the podcast show notes. Let's get back to the video. This is another one that says higher intakes of potassium and magnesium, but not lower sodium, reduce cardiovascular risk in the Framingham offspring study. Lower sodium intake was not associated with a lower risk of cardiovascular disease. Potassium intake led to a 34% lower risk of cardiovascular disease, uh, as well as magnesium and calcium. So that is one of the reasons that I build the foundation of the vertical diet to be high in potassium, a potato, uh, some fruit, some yogurt, 
There's 100 milligrams of potassium or of potassium in every ounce of meat that you eat. You can easily cobble together about 4,700 milligrams of potassium a day. Uh, uh, Dr. Baker's probably getting that just from the meat that he eats. There's some, I hate to appeal to authority, but there are some good authorities on this that uh, to reference. Lane Norton is one of them. He says, sodium is not a problem. It's a critical nutrient for every cell in the body. It's responsible for creating action potentials in your nervous system. Its association with heart disease is confounded by the healthy user bias, again, as we discussed, and consumption of processed food and increased sodium consumption. Uh, your kidneys will increase sodium excretion and vice versa. The blood volumes, as you mentioned, very tightly regulated. That's what your kidneys are for. Um, when you deplete sodium, your body increases aldosterone, uh, aldosterone and retains water. Um, blood levels of sodium do not change in studies. Uh, Lane has said specifically the same thing I said, which I didn't realize uh, until I read this article of Lane, uh, that he has some clients consuming over 10,000 milligrams of sodium a day and their health markers are normal. I said the same thing in my video some three years ago and I just got lambasted and attacked, of course, by the medical community. Mm -hmm. I do have clients consuming that much. I have clients who are salty sweaters. Lane Johnson's one of them. It was salting, he was sweating out five grams of sodium an hour. And so obviously we had to <laughs> put in an intervention. He, the Philadelphia Eagles are, uh, they're, they're tested by Dr. Sandra Godick from the Heat Institute. She's a PhD in thermoregulation and hydration, and she'll do salt testing by using a patch. Uh, and so she has these specific measurements, and then she um, gives them a hydration protocol that they utilize. So she's, it's, a, it's a high salt drink with two wow. sugars. They use dextrose and maltodextrin. I, I've been recommending fructose and dextrose in a two to one ratio of dextrose to fructose because it's easier on the stomach to digest. But uh, when you combine those, you have better uptake. Uh, Sean Wells, who's a nutritional biochem biochemist and he's a fellow of the ISSN, uh, he says he thinks it's the most beneficial ergogenic aid for athletes uh, use, utilizing salt. Helps with brain fog, as I mentioned, cramps, improves performance, stamina, endurance, recovery. Uh, it's the most abundant electrolyte lost during exercise when you're sweating. And again, mentions the epi epidemiology confounded by ultra-processed food consumption uh, and talks about the benefits of sodium bicarbonate as well for, uh, as a buffer for hydrogen ion uh, activity. Eric Trexler from Mass Research Review. Uh, sodium heart disease risk is through sodium's increase in blood pressure, which would only apply to, to hypertensives who weren't getting sufficient uh, potassium. It's only relevant for salt-sensitive individuals, and even then it's dose-dependent, and salt concentration-dependent. Very important to remember. If you're going to consume a can of Pringles and not drink any water, you're going to have a problem. The salt concentration is important. If you drink sufficient fluid with your sodium intake, you're not going to have the same uh, adverse effects. Uh, mentioning again, 25 to 30 percent of the population is salt-sensitive. 5 to 15 percent is reverse salt sensitive. Lane Norton said this as well, which I didn't read earlier. Uh, those people, when they get low sodium, have an increase in blood pressure. Mm -hmm. The reason that I talked about it, not only in terms of performance for athletes and the amount that they sweat out, but I talked about the fact that as a personal trainer, somebody who's trained thousands of clients over the years, worked in gyms, owned gyms, uh, still trained clients, when you get a middle-aged woman or, or elderly woman that comes in and uses the leg press and then stands up and has to hold on because she's dizzy, you realize that that's because of salt depletion and the fix to that problem is getting sufficient salt. I just had a guy yesterday DM me two days ago. He said, Stan, I'm throwing up after workouts. Why is that? And I said, you need some, uh, like a Gatorade during your training, something in a, in a salt tablet. The very next day he's like, oh my God, I had an amazing day, set a PR. I've been getting that kind of feedback. We've talked about it before, probably the second most uh, frequent piece of feedback I get after probably the CPAP for sleep apnea is from people who incorporate salt into their diet and see a substantial improvement in their performance in the gym. Alan Argon is last on this list. Large scale scientific reviews have, have determined there's no reason for people with normal blood pressure to restrict sodium intake. It's been known for 20 years that people with high blood pressure who don't want to lower their salt intake can simply consume more potassium containing foods. Dutch researchers determined that a low potassium intake has the same impact on your blood pressure as high salt consumption does. The average guy consumes about 3,100 milligrams of potassium a day, 1,600 milligrams less than recommended. These are all, I think, highly regarded individuals commenting about the very same thing I've been saying, we've been saying for many years now, that uh, of course I've taken lots of 
of uh, incoming uh, assaults because of, of how it might adversely affect uh, a sodium sensitive, hypertensive, elderly, in, uh, obese individual. Yeah, I, I want to add. You know, I, I just back. I interviewed Bill Schindler, and, and again, he he deal. He goes out and lives with all these indigenous tribes around the world, and every single one of those tribes seeks out salt to add to their diet. And the point Stan makes about the correlation between sodium consumption and also processed food is the biggest confounder. I mean, you you know, if you look at where is most of the salt coming from, it's coming from junk food. So Mm -hmm. to blame, again, it's the same, you know, misconception. We're blaming the junk food or blaming the salt for what the junk food is doing. You know, I think, uh, you know, I find from a performance standpoint, in fact, I failed to do that before we worked out this morning. Usually I'll take some salt. And Beforehand, do that. yeah. We Beforehand. were down it after. Right, right. So Still got them laying around here. Right, so I should have done it before. I would have probably got an extra rep or two. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> yeah. You want to rematch, don't right, you? Yeah, exactly. We're coming with back here salt. for your next birthday. Yeah, with some salt. Yeah. But I mean, it was, you know, and, and as we point out, I've been on a low-carb diet for now eight or nine years. I was on, you know, low-carb diets before I started the carnivore diet. And I learned early on that restoring my hydration prior to training was important you talked about the compressibility of the muscles and you know when you when you're more hydrated and your muscles are more hydrated you're stronger you perform better that feeling right so it's you feel you're you're swelled up you know and it's almost like you're wearing a bench shirt yeah yeah. (laughs) (laughs) hey little mama let me whisper in your ear like comment subscribe to the channel because we continue to bring you peak content on this channel obviously you guys are here you guys watched the whole video so like comment subscribe all right see you later